I will hereby call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Select Board. The time is 6.32 p.m. Our first order of business will be to approve the minutes of our last meeting, which was June 3rd, 2024. At this time, I've entertained a motion to that effect. I motion we approve the minutes from June 4th. Third. Third, sorry. Second. Motion made, any second? Second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Crystal Drake Tremblay. Aye. Aye. Aye, Nathaniel Waring. All right, three nothing, Jeff, thank you. Okay. All right, our first order of business will be to appoint a new highway laborer. Jeff, do you want to introduce George and the new laborer, please? Yep, this is George and Daniel yeah. Chimzinski, but I, Boone is how he prefers yeah. to be called, so. So this this is our new our new employee, hopefully, and uh, he's got many years of experience. Truck driving, plowing, sanding, equipment repair, so I think he's gonna be a great candidate for us. Excellent. Wonderful. And he already knows Sunderland, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and here his whole life, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, any questions from the board uh, to either of the gentlemen? No. I'm good. All right. As always, George, we need to put our faith in your uh, expertise and your opinion, so we will take your word that he is the wonderful employee. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, at the time, I would entertain a motion to appoint uh, our new highway laborer. All right. I motion we appoint Daniel Boone Chimsinski as the new highway laborer. Second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Crystal Drake Tremblay. Aye. Aye. Nathaniel Waring. 3 nothing, Jeff. Congratulations and welcome aboard. We are very excited to have you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you tomorrow. See right. you tomorrow. We'll be there. <laughs> All righty. Uh, moving along, next order of business is the Sunderland Elementary School roof discussion. Do you want to give everyone a little bit of background, Jeff? Yeah. So, uh, about 21 years ago, the school roof collapsed and it was replaced. Um, it, it's a shingled roof. Um, there was a report done in April um, that outlined some of the issues and... I think the, the overall feeling is that the roof is beginning to um, not function as a roof, starting to leak, and, and it's only going to get worse. Um, it's not going to get better, so we can continue repairing it, or we can um, bite the bullet and replace the roof. Um, so the discussion is, we're starting a discussion about funding, um, a discussion about whether and how to incorporate solar, if that's something we want to do. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to school committee slash superintendent. Sure. Sure. Hello everyone, Darius Budasso, your superintendent. Um, so basically, um, we did have, uh, you know, we've had a lot of, uh, shingles popping up because the nails are pushing them up and there's been some other cracks and some minor leakings that have been fixed. We recently, Frontier right now is having a roof project being done by Titan Roofers, and um, we asked if they would come over and give us their, uh, give us an assessment of the roof. They are the ones who did the repair of the roof, not the repair, the re, the second time the roof was done, and did, the, one that, the one that held up um, in 2003. Um, and they, so Jeff, that, that document I created was that was not shared? It, was shared late and I brought physical copies. So Dan I mean, may be the only one who's seen it. Screen? Uh, Can I do that or? Mm, I can do that. Can you open it? It just will give them something to follow along. Yeah. yeah. There it is. So in that that hyperlink right there, the roof assessment report um, was the you know Titan's uh, assessment of the roof. It's not in dire dire straits right now. It's starting to show its age, and 
we can anticipate more leaking as the years come on. Um, so below that, as I said, the, year, the roof is 21 years old, which, um, you know, it was kind of, if you figure you get a few more years out of the roof, but it's kind of really weathered. Um, I don't know if it was the quality of the shingle or um, just that it gets a lot of sun, I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, moving on, the, at the last school committee meeting, um, which was actually a month ago, I think the last month, month prior, um, I did a quick report on the Massachusetts Building Authority as a funding source. Um, and currently, the, and if you want to scroll down, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, you. In order to qualify to apply, the way that it works, there's roofs, um, uh, the, the roof has to be 25 years old. And so we couldn't even begin to apply for the roof until 2028. Um, and then the timeline and application can be, a, can be up to two years. And other area schools have been in the queue for up to four to six years before being awarded the projects or doing other ways of funding them. <coughs> um, we kind of made the recommendation, I, I, we made the recommendation not to go and wait on this. Um, also, the, the uh, Massachusetts Building Authority, um, you have to go through their process of redoing a roof. And when we did Deerfield, there was a lot of controversy, there was a lot of wasted spending and that the actual savings that the town received was debatable. Um, it's a big, it, was a big, it was a fiery debate amongst contractors in town and whatnot that you had to use, um, you had to follow the uh, MSBA rules for you know, who could do the bidding and who could do the work and, um, and all the steps, you had the project managers and all the other kind of things, that, all the steps they had in place um, for that size of project. And so, you know, some of them being a similar size project. Um, you can look at the, uh, Titan also gave us a estimate for, now this is a planning estimate, it's not an estimate that we can take to market, but um, you know, basically, um, as you can see, we had one in 2022 when we started talking about this. Um, it's gone up you know, just short of $100,000 on the June estimate there. That's another hyperlink too, you can click on if you need to. Um, so with engineering, and probably gonna have to throw um, some money as for if there's any leakage and plywood replacement and that kind of stuff, you know, we're looking at around six hundred eighty thousand um, dollars. And then comes the conversation that um, should we put solar on the building? It does have a great facing roof, um, but that really expands the project in multiple ways. It expands it in cost, expands it in the amount of planning and that kind of stuff. Um, and so my opinion, I would say the school opinion, but the administrator's opinion of, um, is that we should break into two separate projects, have it be looked at by the engineering as they look at it, can they support um, that kind of thing? But um, I don't know what the town of Sunderland is be part of the conversation either tonight or to talk about in the future. If you have an energy committee that's active who put in the field next to the school? Do, is that, you know, um, do the expertise of who put that in still exist in town? Um, those are just my ideas. But, um, you know, obviously if you go and do it all as one, it's more money, it's gonna probably take a little bit longer. Um, and I'm gonna need support doing that. I can't go on, take on a full solar project and roof project along with all the other responsibilities. Um, and then obviously what the funding would look like. There are funding things out there for green communities and, and other things for solar. Um, I imagine there might be new stuff coming up every year that we should keep an eye on. Um, yeah. Um, I did put in, if you scroll back up, a generic timeline, but just it for, you know, we've gone through some roof projects. We just did Frontiers roof projects and a lot of other capital projects throughout the district. So. You know, basically just looking through, you know, before we can go out to bid, we have to secure the funding. Um, if it goes through the town meeting order, um, you know, again, next April, then we have to contract with the engineer, project design, bidding, you want to get doing, you know, in the middle of the winter when um, all the companies are setting up their slate for the following uh, summer. Um, and as you can just kind of basically see, this is so this is shooting for a 2026 um, summer work time, project time. Again, 
that timeline is just to give folks an idea who haven't been part of projects like this how it works, you know. And you guys obviously do a lot. Select board does a lot with this, but anybody else watching. Um, you could move that up if you did winter, you know, put on your winter agenda, depending on how you're funding it and that kind of stuff. Um, so the main, you know, one of the reasons we want to bring it here is because, um, you know, we're talking about you guys created a capital stabilization account. It's in the queue on that list. Um, kind of want to talk to you about where we're at and how do we save for it for the next few years. And you know, I think just full transparency on the project. That's neat. Questions, I guess. Thank you, Dave. So I, I would say that, and I don't want to speak for the rest of the board, certainly they can speak for themselves in a minute, but for, for me, the concerns are one, we don't do anything with the roof project that's going to make putting solar on it in the future harder. Choosing a roof type that doesn't work with solar or that you know has to be torn back up to put something on, um, and or doing prep work, knowing that a solar project is potentially in the future, like having the the framework for the solar built into the roof or at least designed in in a way where it's, it's going to reduce costs. Um, I also would hope that in the engineering part of that we can get some sort of number as it's going to cost X amount of money to do the roof by itself, it's going to cost Y amount of money to do the, the roof, the solar by itself, and this is what it would cost to do them together. Um, my, my question is, does it save money in the long run over both projects to do them together, i.e. Are we, are we doing certain work that has to be done twice when through the separate projects? Um, if that's the case, and it still makes sense to do them separately, great. I just, that's the whole point of this conversation is, is starting to we get the ball rolling on what are our options, how much will it cost. Um, in my head, the way I'm imagining this is based on your timeline, we do the roof project in the 2025-2026 year with the you know metal bases for the solar already built into it or otherwise having the engineering for that in mind um, and then have a phase two project maybe a year or so, two later that puts the solar up on top of that. Um, and to your point about not wanting to have to try to, as the superintendent, to run both of them, um, I agree that I think that the energy committee would likely be running the, the solar project. Um, and that way, if we did it in two phases, we'd be able to separate that out, um, and also in terms of funding and other, other concerns. Um, but again, really, my big concern here is just not putting up a roof that makes the solar impossible or harder or prohibitively more cost, you know, it may not make sense cost-wise. Um, Crystal, Dan, do you want to layer anything onto that? Well, I think that sounds right. I mean, just want to make sure we do it right. And if, it, if there was savings to be had, or if there was a grant program that helped with doing the two together or something like that, uh, we should look at it. But otherwise, I think I think they normally go, you do the roof and then the solar comes, but I'm not 100% certain. I mean, one, you know, you're going to, if you put that out to bid, it's going to be somebody who's going to own the project and have to sub bid the, the solar. There's not many. I don't know of roofing companies that do roofing and solar together. It's usually a specialty. So, you know, there's going to be subcontractors on that kind of thing. Um, I absolutely agree we can have the engineering include solar feasibility. And um, the biggest thing you're going to have to look at is, you know, weight of the solar panels and such. Um, I imagine they're getting lighter every year now, too. But um, that was a concern that we had in your neighboring town up in Deerfield that their, that roof couldn't support the amount of solar that if you covered the whole thing. So. Um, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, it would be a cost I think we would add to the engineering um, to get that part of that part done. And there is a lot of incentive programs out there and there might even be more up and coming. I don't know anything about that. It's outside my wheelhouse. But, you know, the, you know I had talked with our state legislators about, um, you know, because you know, as we were looking at Frontier as well, was is there any state monies coming after municipal buildings to redo the roof and do the solar at the same time. You do both together. I mean, it makes complete sense to all the um, taxpayers out there that, you know, why are we not throwing solar on every municipal building mm -hmm. just to lower the taxpayer costs and use some of that rainy day fund money of billions of dollars the state has to offset that. But um, that's me wishing. But you would think that there may be programs coming out, and I don't know where those are announced because I don't probably get those emails. Um, I mean, I'll look through my association and such, but. I don't know if the energy committee gets, um, you know, those kind of what's new or what's coming down the pike for um, in the next few years. 
Crystal? Yeah. Oh, of course I am. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of in a good position when we start talking about the solar, too, because we've got a brand new boiler, we've got a brand new oil tank there, so we could potentially, you know, do solar also in phasing. You know what I mean? First get up enough solar to, you know, run AC and hot water and, you know, gradually increase the amount of solar there too and being able to take advantage of you know multiple projects over multiple years to get that solar up and running there i i think we have to move towards solar work i'm sorry i didn't hear that was me my phone sorry <laughs> I would think that would be something we look at when the engineering talks about, I mean, there's a lot of roof there. <laughs> if you, those who are driven by the elementary school, it's a lot of roof, so that's a lot of solar. So it's, it's if, you're, if you're going to do full maximum coverage, it's going to be expensive. Yeah. Um, so doing in phases might be the way to go. And I mean, we, can, we start looking at costs and what the building can support. I think that will dictate that. Yeah, I think that, that doing that first state phase of, of doing the roof with the infrastructure needed and the engineering needed to support the weight and support the, the structures for the solar, and then being able to ask Crystal say, as says, do phases going forward. Maybe it takes us 10 years, you know, every two years doing a fifth of the school to get there, um, but I just want to make sure that we take that into consideration when we're doing the roof so that we have that infrastructure set up. Um, and not to change others, but back to your one of the other points on your slide about the grant system, um, my experience in the past has been a lot of times that you end up spending the same amount of money, the state puts a whole bunch more money because that's how much more the project costs and it takes like, 10 times as long and you don't have as much control over it and things kind of get out of hand in that way. Um, my understanding was that from a capital, uh, capital stabilization standpoint, we had budgeted for being able to pay for this roof over the next 10 years in our capital stabilization calculations and override and whatnot. Um, and given the cost and whatnot, I, I, I would, my vote would be to doing it as an in-house project um, over spending the next 10 years trying to get a grant to pay for it and still having that out of pocket for the town be substantial. Um, in my opinion, but that, that's the way I would lean on that. And the, only, oh, sorry. the only other curveball throughout, throughout regarding that timeline is that you, if you have a funding source to have the engineering do that first, prior to getting the full, I don't know, you know we've done that in other projects where you, you get the engineering done first and then you go after the money so you have an idea of a, because you know everybody, the, the solar question is going to be where the public's going to come in on this project. It's great, you're new roof, you're putting solar on that. Oh, we don't know, we're, you know, that, we're going to wait and find out. You could say, you know, we want to pay for the engineering up front. It's going to have to be done either way. Um, so, you know, I say it's up to $30,000. That's just on like projects. Um, but if you, I don't know, it's like, I don't know your politics, how you, what control of monies you have, but if you want to do that prior to taking it to the town so you have the engineering done, you're going to have at that point a real cost estimate and with the solar impact on ahead of time. I'm just looking at looking at the timeline, I'm thinking that's something that could be changed um, and provide you more information. You know, we'll and that is, that is something we can discuss is, is using some of the remainder of the ARPA money that we have to appropriate for the engineering part of this so that we can get that engineering at least started or hopefully completed by the time we get around to you know, um, 2025 annual town meeting, so that we, we, as you said, we have a better idea going into that town meeting of what the cost of town is, and then we're appropriating money for the project at that point and, and moving forward with it. Um, yeah, okay. Any uh, any public comment from any of the people on Zoom or otherwise? We also have the Ener Energy Committee, and I know that they've been talking about potentially um, solar canopies over the uh, parking lot at the school too and they also investigate you know we I broached this with uh, Aaron and David and so I think they did some initial investigation maybe or talked to some people so I didn't know if they wanted to speak yeah both of them look like they wanted to um, I'm gonna start with Aaron and then we'll go to David afterwards if you don't mind thank you um, 
Prior to this meeting, I had a conversation with Beth Greenblatt of Beacon Integrated Solutions. You might be aware that Beth was our consultant and sort of prime mover behind the solar array that's outside the elementary school. Now, the town has a choice with regard to solar. It can purchase the equipment, the solar equipment outright, which is very expensive, or we can do what we did with the solar array, which is invite a third party to, um, it's their equipment. They draw up a power purchase agreement with the town. So the town has use of the solar power and without having to pay for all the equipment. But we do have an option to buy the equipment after 20 years, which is the same arrangement we have with the array that's outside. So that's certainly a cheaper way of going about it. Um, however, because we already have the array there, we cannot broker with a separate um, company. We would have to go through the same company, which is Kearsarge Energy, in order to, to uh, put additional solar there from a third party. So we're limited in that respect. Um, you're absolutely right that a structural engineering study needs to be done to make sure that the roof can bear not only the snow loads, but the additional weight of the solar panels. Um, Beth mentioned that if part of the roof covers an atrium, that is probably no good for solar. It cannot bear the weight. Um, back when we installed the, the solar project at the school, they did look into the possibility of carports or solar canopies. And at that time, it was cost prohibitive. It was just way too expensive. Um, such projects are more expensive than roof mounted systems because of the, all the infrastructure needed to create the canopy itself. And um, there are also economies of scale. As you've seen at UMass, they have large parking lots covered with these solar canopies. Uh, for smaller areas, it's less attractive to companies because they have to put in all the cost of building the foundation and the steel and the structure to hold the solar array. And uh, that won't be offset by a large solar dividend uh, if it's just a small area. It's not out of the question, but it's, it's probably less attractive to companies to do that. Um, there are also utility uh, connection costs to, to bear in mind. It's not just a matter of, of buying the panels, but it's also hooking them up to the grid. And uh, those can be substantial, as we found out last time. Um, so Beth Greenblatt said she would be happy to talk with or meet with the select board. She's far more knowledgeable about these matters than I am. And she was very helpful to the, to the board in the town last time around. So she said she is available and willing to talk through the various options that the town has and recommend perhaps what she thinks the best way to proceed might be. Yeah, that would be a great idea. Um, always good to go to the source for that kind of stuff. Um, Jeff, is that something that you can facilitate reaching out to her about having her come in and meet with us at a future date? Yep, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Did you have anything else to do? Is that good? Um, that's pretty much it. Um, she said that if we do go through a, a third party, like your Sarge, we would have to pay for the engineering study. They would not do that. They okay. would want that to be done before they even consider the project. So that's definitely in our ballpark. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. David, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, uh, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Uh, just that, of course, the Energy Committee 100% supports solar uh, power development within Sunderland. We think it's a great thing where we've been working uh, it's something that we would like to put this kind of energy to into the the elementary school represents I think a really fantastic opportunity uh, especially if it can be a roof mounted system rather than a, a freestanding system like we currently have out there because the expense uh, is so much greater uh, obviously when you're putting solar panels on a roof you want to make sure that the roof is as new as possible so generally uh, solar companies will, <laughs> will make sure that you, your roof is in good shape and 
the best time to do it obviously is right when the new roof has been installed so you're talking about that anyway so this this would be a great opportunity um, to dovetail these two projects together uh, the other thing um, I think we should talk about at some point maybe not this evening but somewhere down the line is what the electrical needs are of the school uh, you know currently we have fossil fuels heating um, the space and uh, performing a whole variety of different functions but i think as we move forward into the future m more and more systems are going to be getting away from the fossil fuel regime and more into an electrification system so i don't know what the current electrical needs of the elementary school are but those will only increase as we integrate things like heat pumps uh, get away from the fossil fuel boilers and hot water heaters and uh, space heaters etc uh, so it's just something to think about for future planning. All, all residences and, uh, and uh, industrialized and municipal buildings, I think, will be moving in that direction. So it's, this is a great opportunity for Sunderland to generate a lot of its own electricity if we make some of the right decisions at this point in time. I completely agree, and we're actually in the process of putting me uh, splits in at the school at it. As we right. speak. Okay. So that, that's definitely a, a big a big deal for us. Um, and yeah, as time goes on, that's going to be more so, more and more the case. My hope is this is the last time we put a boiler, uh, a fossil fuel boiler, or tank, or anything like that in this in this building or in any school in Sunderland. That by the time we, we did, this system is ready to be replaced, it's because we have fully electrically <laughs> pumped everything right. else out. Um, right. And it's, Maybe even before it gets to end of life, we end up talking about being a backup system and having fully transitioned over. Um, that's not happening in the next two years, but you know, in right. the next decade or so, that was something I would like to to, to, to have us be moving towards. Um, well, Aaron, I'm really yeah, I'm really happy to hear you say that. That's very encouraging. Yep, Aaron, I, you're up, um, and then I'll go to to Cindy. Cindy. Yes, I just wanted to add one comment about um, since it was brought up about green communities funding. Now, typically, green communities funding is only available for energy savings. In other words, if you're, if the system you're installing uses less energy than the system that's being replaced, that can be funded by green communities. Simply changing the mode of electricity or energy generation without energy savings is not funded by green communities. However, there is one exception, and that was what Chris was mentioned, that if solar arrays are used to replace fossil fuel generated systems through electrification that can be funded for green communities. So they don't just fund solar, but they will fund solar if it replaces fossil fuel generation. Yep, which is obviously the goal, of course. All right, um, Cindy, you have your hand up? Yes, I do. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, because I keep hearing different information, <clears throat> to remind everybody that the school and all the town buildings except for the town park and Gray's Memorial Library are directly benefiting from the solar at the school and it's directly connected to the meter at the school so and it's evenly or not evenly distributed it's distributed proportionally to the, all the other town buildings so we are benefiting from solar at the school right now and that's a good point <laughs> that it doesn't just have to be talking about the school's energy needs in right. terms of using solar it can also be talking about the town's needs in general because just because it's at this location of the school doesn't mean it, could, it can't be being allocated or otherwise accounted for for use in other town buildings um, and there's plenty of them and there's plenty of electricity being used um, and as the library is also an example of another town building that we're in the process of putting means puts in so there's more energy need and more you know reification that we can mm -hmm. Point to, uh, I, think, I think Beth would be a great um, great idea to have her come in or speak however remotely. She is a guru on this subject. Um, I've been working with her for years since that solar field went in. We had a conversation recently about all this stuff knowing this was coming up. So I think she would be perfect to get involved at this point in the planning part so everybody understands everything that's involved. Yep, completely agree. Wonderful. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, anyone else from the Energy Committee? Or after, Jeff, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I had a, a couple questions. Uh, Aaron, you said we'd have to work with Kearsarge. Is that because 
Is that true if we installed a completely separate system and didn't expand the existing system because it's the same parcel or? No, it's, it's because it would be behind the meter. Ah. And we can't have two different systems. There's no way of separating them out. <coughs> if they're both behind the meter. Okay. Um, and then. Well, from my, oh, sorry. No, go, ahead, go Crystal. No, go ahead, finish your. <laughs> these are these are totally different thoughts. <laughs> so with the system that's there at the school net now, couldn't you again if from an engineering perspective take the meter off the school, put it closer to the existing panels there, and start building a system on the school for only the school? Freeing up more of that electricity from that solar field to be distributed through the town and keep the school the panels and stuff on the school for size wise to start with for just the school. I think that's probably something we could ask Beth about. Yeah. Um, unless Aaron, you know. I I have a feeling they would violate our contract with Kearsarge if we did that, but that's no for sure. And my, my only other question on that, and that's not something that I think anyone's going to have an answer for me today, is just what does that mean in terms of the way the town has to appropriate things and bidding and whatnot, or is the town even able to say, well, we only have one choice in this case because of the contract, or does that contract sort of enable that to happen? And that's kind of a question for, for you and legal counsel, Jeff. Um, because I, I don't want to find myself in a position where other other contractors say, well, it's not fair that you, that you get this this, this bid, this non-bid contract. Um, I would just want to be very careful about that and figure out how we want to do that. Um, yeah. But anyway, that's, a, that's sort of an aside. Um, and, and, and who knows where we decide whether or not that's the, the right path for this particular set of solar panels or whether the town wants to look towards getting a de de exclusion to do it ourselves and reap the benefits of doing that ourselves. Um, I mean, I know the companies have to be making a profit somehow, so there is definitely, you know, an upside for them in terms of the initial investment and the long-term, you know, money that they get from the town. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that that isn't also beneficial for the town, but I do want us to be, do our due diligence and see whether it makes more sense for us to do it as a, you know, we, we put the money up front, but, but collect all the benefit, um, or, you know, as the, as the committee has said, do it the way we've done it in the past. Um, I certainly want to look at numbers and whatnot before we made a decision in that respect. Um, but I do want, Jeff, if you don't mind asking legal counsel about that, because I, I do want to know whether that's going to cause us trouble or not. That may help inform our decision about which way to go in terms of funding sources in that in that regard. Okay. Uh, um, questions for the school. Um, there, the elementary school is getting electrical upgrades and a building management system in the next couple of years. Will those, I don't know anything about either of those, but we're talking about solar and electricity, so I figured I would sure. make sure that they're, that, that right. whatever. So, so to get everybody up to speed, who's was in the room um, on the meeting. So we did get um, a power upgrade. Right currently our electrical needs can't be handled by the panels that are in the building. So um, we did get uh, $14,000 to address that and um, 81,000 to do nine rooms of um, uh, heat pump and heat pump AC um, and starting that project as well. So that's, that's what's going on in the building and then going on what you were saying before regarding, eventually that does not include a, a, a building management system to run all the to get the different components talking to each other. So our, um, you know, our oil heater is not talking to our electric cooler. Okay, and so technically you could have both on at the same time. I mean, we'll have, we'll have management systems that are manual to take that on, but eventually we wanna put in a BMS system for energy savings. That is something I wanna get on the energy committees. I'm right now working with, um, in other towns as well to try to see if there is, because there's energy savings there, if that can be applied to either um, green communities or any other grant that's out there. Um, and so I want to, you know, tap that resource in the town as well. So we're not just, bit, so no one's just a few, half a year behind those schools within that um, um, 
but that's kind of the plan is we're putting the system, we're getting the AC in first and then buying the business, building management system in afterwards. And whether or not you agree with the logic, my logic is get the cooling air in there, make those classrooms comfortable first and then find the money to save the energy on top of that. Um, so yeah, so that's the next one. The cost of the building management system right now, our um, professional quote is $140,000. And so that includes, you know, that would include, you know, lighting, heating, cooling, um, and so that, you know, all classrooms can be, can be you know, energy managed. And the new, you know, from sensor lights to all the other kind of things that you would have as part of that system for energy savings. The only other question I had is, um, is the school looking at replacing the shingled roof with shingles, um, considering metal roof, considering solar shingle, the Tesla, so like, I, I don't know what else is out there, um, or if you have a preference and you know what you want. No, we went with the asphalt shingle roofs that's on there now. Well, no, we went with a 30 year roof instead of, I think it's on there to 25, let's go with the 25 year roof, it's failing that early. Um, is what's on there a metal roof would you know that would be an investment the town would want to have to decide um but i'm sure that would be three times the cost so you're talking about a million and a half probably do a metal roof on that and i don't know how that affects solar i imagine i'm gonna guess putting solar on a metal roof is punching holes in a roof is probably not a good thing but i don't you know I'd let the experts talk about that um the tesla roof i don't know anything i mean i know what you're talking about but i haven't seen that in application yet well, I think that's sort of the point of why we want to make sure that the engineering includes the solar is because if the engineer reports, oh yeah, metal roof is a great idea, not thinking about solar, and then we get a couple years down the line, they say, oh yeah, it's going to completely destroy the roof and can't put it up there. You know, that's sort of the whole point is that we want to choose a roof material that is in line with the eventual goal of putting solar on that roof so that we do that in a way that makes sense for everybody involved. Um, so great. Thank you very much, Darius. I think that's, that's good. Um, do we have anyone else on the school committee or on the... Any committee that wanted to say anything? I don't see any hands up, but I also can't see everybody, so. I will take that silence as a no. Um, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate everyone coming together to talk about this. Um, we felt like a good opportunity to bring the committee together and the school together to talk about something that's uh, great for the future of the town um, and for the future of our planet. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, we will schedule a meeting with the uh, consultant and um, be in touch with all of you all about next steps and whatnot. Great. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, next up on our on our agenda is the disposal of a surplus police equipment, the Chevy Tahoe. Yes. So for context, every now and then the town ends up with a piece of equipment, often an old police cruiser or something like that, that we uh, no longer have use for. I believe the limit is under 5,000, or maybe they just up it to under 10,000, something like that. Um, I, items like that, the town's able to send to auction and, and, and use that money for whatever. I don't know how that works, but maybe Jeff can say better. Um, so we have a Chevy Tahoe that the, the, the police is no longer using, um, and they would like to put that up on the uh, auction site. Is that correct, Jeff? Yes, yep, and the, the letter that I sent included um, some bicycles and metal filing cabinets. Anything under a thousand dollars is the chief procurement officer. I can um, help the departments dispose of that. So you know, we're just talking about the Tahoe right now. Um, it is valued at over a thousand dollars. It was the one that we replaced with the hybrid cruiser um, a couple years ago, and so at this point, um, I think the. The trade-in value or the, the offer was like two hundred dollars or two fifty, and the chief thought we could get at least five hundred if we put it out for auction. So um, he's recommending we use Municipid. Basically, they, I I believe they do all of it from coming out and taking pictures of the vehicle to you know placing it, um, and it all complies with state procurement laws. So. Um, I, you know, he, he's recommended we've done do that. as well. Is that correct? We, we, we've used that live that service for other surpluses in the past. Remembering, mm, not that I can recall. Um, I don't believe 
I've used municipid, but it doesn't mean that we haven't as a town. Great. Um, all right, wonderful. Any questions from the board on that? Just on the what, bicycles, can, can we give those away? To, uh, we can actually get money for them, or how's that work? Yeah, so that um, I will talk to the chief about what he wants to do. Um, yeah. I think that we can donate them. Um, I was I don't know what shape the bikes yeah. are in, but I know that we have a business in town that does bike tours. Maybe you know, rather than sitting and rotting behind the police station. Um, but yeah, we would certainly try to give them away or maybe offer them if they're in usable shape to, to school children or something. Okay. So, yeah. Maybe the bike, the library can lend bikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this kayak doesn't seem to be holding water very well. <laughs> right. um, wonderful. So at the time, you just need a, uh, a motion to approve selling the, the Tahoe? Yeah, uh, declaring the Tahoe surplus property, yep. Okay, at this time I've entertained a motion to declare the Chevy Tahoe as surplus property. And motion should we declare the Chevy Tahoe for the police department as surplus property? Second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded to declare the Chevy Tahoe as surplus property. All those in favor? Aye, Crystal Drake Tremblay. Aye. Aye, Nathaniel Waring. Three nothing, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have board and committee appointments. Yes. <clears throat> um, sorry, I'm just going. Okay. Um, I'm going to read through the board and committee appointments. Sorry, I have employees first, so I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Um, and then, Cindy, since you're still on. Feel free to hop in when I get something wrong. Um, people that we are reappointing. Burial agent, Wendy Hool. Um, Capital Improvement Planning Committee. Nathaniel Waring, Mike Skibiski, Peter Gagarin, Dana Roscoe, Rock Warner, and Lauren Starr. Um, as the Civil Defense Emergency Management Director, Lori Smith. For the Community Preservation Committee, Megan Arquin, Stuart Beckley, Ellie Kurth, Jennifer Uncles, Helen Clark. This is, I have to look into this. Sorry. Um, those people and potentially one other. Um, It wasn't Mike, sorry, Cindy, was Mike Wesseman was on, right? Yeah, he's the other one. Yeah, okay. Yes. And, and Mike Wesseman, yes. sorry. Um, and then Conservation Committee, um, Mark Zynan, uh, Ellie Kurth, Jennifer Uncles, Nancy Pick, um, Constables, Fred Laurinaitis, Alan Richards, Mike Wozniakiewicz, Council on Aging, LaDonna Alanik, and Marianne Kowalik. Economic Development Committee, Jim Bernotis, Nathaniel Waring, Fred Laurinaitis, and Rock Warner Jr. Emergency Management Director, Lori Smith. Um, Energy Committee, Aaron Falbell, David Goodwin, Laura Williams, Meg Fisher, Krugman. Uh, Dan, did we appoint you as the Franklin County Solid Waste Management Rep? Or? I'm not sure if you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm getting email. <laughs> okay. Well, if we want to, I think Dan asked about that, and I, I don't know that we have. Um, I thought we did. I, you might have. You might have. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say that we're appointing Daniel Murphy to the Franklin County Solid Waste Management. Um, the Franklin County Regional Planning Board, I think was David Dean Cindy. Did we not get a response from him? Do you know? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll leave I always, that. I'm sorry. I always send it to the chairs okay. of some of these committees um, to reach out to their folks. Okay. Because that's a committee appointment. Right. 
to the planning board. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim Bernotis is the Franklin Tech rep. Um, Historical Commission, Helen Clark, Stephen Schneider, Jessica Skibiski, Craig Felton, Marianne Gunderson, and Margaret Orellop. I'm going to apologize if I mess up anybody's names. Um, Housing Committee, Stuart Beckley uh, and Crystal Drake Tremblay uh, and Peter Jessup. Uh, Parking Clerk, Heather Davis. Personnel Committee, George Emery. Valerie Voorhees, Crystal Drake Tremblay, and Mike Wozniakiewicz. Registrars, Ed Kelly and Al Richards. All right, select board appointments. And feel free to, we'll do it like town meeting, call a hold if you want to change one of these. Uh, housing, Crystal is housing committee, Community Preservation Committee, Personnel Committee, um, everybody's on uh, the Emergency Preparedness Team, and Crystal's also on South County EMS. Dan is on the Ditch Committee. Ah, there we go. Franklin County Solid Waste Management District Rep, FERCOG Rep, Senior Center, uh, Emergency Preparedness, and Village Center Committee. And Nathaniel is Capital Planning Committee, Economic Development Committee, Emergency Preparedness, um, and the Union 38 and Instructional Assistant Representative for Negotiations. Um, uh, South County EMS Board of Oversight Community Rep, uh, Tom Feidenkavitz. So we're back to committees now. Um, Sunderland Ditch Committee, Gerald Bach, um, James Mm. James Perot moved out of town. He's not. Uh, Gerald Bach, um, Mark Benjamin, and Dan Murphy. S the emergency preparedness team, in addition to the select board, Stephen Ball, Ben Barshevsky, George Emery, Fred Laurinaitis, myself, uh, the police chief, and the fire chief. Um, I am the network and electronic resources agent the procurement officer, the ADA coordinator, PVTA representative, ethics municipal liaison, community economic development strategy rep, and super records something officer, records accountability officer, I think. Um, town council, KP Law, um, Veterans Memorial Oversight Committee, uh, Michael Ahern for a two-year appointment, um, and Tom Feidenkevitz for a three-year appointment. Village Center Committee, Kyle Snow, Dan Murphy, Rock Warner, Doug Fulton, Jessica Skibiski, Lauren Starr, Elizabeth Sillen, and Benneth Phelps. And that is it for boards and committees. All right, Crystal or Dan, anything that you wanted to add, change, move around, any of that? I'm good if everybody answers. I'm happy with mine. Dan, are you good with yours? I can roll. All right. Um, do you want us to just uh, do the motion to approve that list, or is that just more informational? Or yeah, to approve the list, and then I'll include it with the minutes. Right. Um, at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the list of appointments as read by Jeff. Motion to approve. A motion. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, you <can. laughs> Motion to approve the list is read by Jeff. Second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded to approve the appointment list as read by Jeff. All those in favor? Aye. Crystal Drake Tremblay. Aye. Aye, Nathaniel Waring. Three nothing, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Um, employee appointments. The accountant uh, contracted with the Ponte and Aponte. Uh, select Board Administrative Assistant, Cynthia Bennett. Um, we are working on hiring a new Assessor's Office Administrative Assistant. Um, the Board of Health is reappointing uh, Stephen Ball and Cynthia Bennett. Um, reappointing Building Commissioner Tom Quinlan, Thomas Quinlan Jr. 
Assistant Building Inspector Mark Snow, Assistant Building Inspector Ronald Lauren, and Assistant Building Inspector Louis Hasbrook. Treasurer Collector Heather Davis, pay Parking Clerk Heather Davis, Payroll Clerk Joanne Beagle, Assistant Treasurer, Treasurer Collector me, uh, Town Administrator me, uh, Chief Procurement Officer me, Jeff Gravitz, um, Point Steve Benjamin as the Fire Chief, Highway Superintendent George Emery, Highway Department Labor John Skrabisky, um, Highway Department Labor <laughs> as of July 1st, Daniel Chimzinski. Uh, Highway Department Temper Laborers, Fred Laurinaitis, Holden Woodward, and Emery Payton. Highway Department Secretary, April Griffin, and Tree Warden, George Emery. Uh, plumbing and Gas Inspector, Anthony Logren. Uh, plumbing and Gas Inspector Alternate, Luke Felton. Police Chief, Eric Dimitropoulos. Police Sergeant Brendan Lyons, full-time police officers, Peter Scoble, Brenda Tozlowski, Benjamin Peters, and Kevin Bannis. Part-time officers Zoe Smith, Vincent Faby, Dale Brown, Jordan Zukowski, Taylor Boudry, Alyssa Farnham, uh, Police Department Clerk April Griffin, and the Animal Control Officer and Animal Inspector Emmy Martin. Um, all, I'll go through them again. Alcohol Enforcement Officers, Eric Dimitropoulos, Brendan Lyons, Peter Scoble, Brenda Tozlowski, Benjamin Peters, Kevin Bannis, Zoe Smith, Vincent Faby, Dale Brown, Jordan Zukowski, Taylor Boudry, Alyssa Farnham. And then poll workers, Eric Dimitropoulos, Brendan Lyons, Peter Scoble, Brenda Tozlowski, Benjamin Peters, Kevin Bannis, Zoe Smith, Vincent Baby, Dale Brown, Jordan Zukowski, Taylor Boudry, and Alyssa Farnham. Payroll, we did that. Uh, Recreation Coordinator, uh, James Ewan. Wiring Inspector, Bill Ehrman. Uh, wiring Inspector Alternate, Paul Miller. Agricultural Commission, um, Jennifer Uncles, Bob Williams, and Megan Arquin. Anti-harassment officer is Elizabeth Sillen. The burial agent is Wendy Houle. Any questions about those? Not for me, Crystal. I'm all set, thank you. Yeah? Nope. All right, at this time, I would entertain a motion to appoint, make the uh, employee appointments as read by Jeff. A motion to make the employee appointments as read by Jeff. Second. All right. At this time, we have a motion made and seconded to make the employee appointments as read by Jeff. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Crystal Drake, John Boy. Aye, Nathaniel Waring. Three nothing, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Next up on our agenda is the marijuana host agreement uh, discussion. Sorry, marijuana host community agreement discussion. Um, just for everyone who's listening is aware. Um, the, the state requires us to have an agreement, um, and Jeff can give us more context about that, um, but it's an agreement between the town and uh, the marijuana establishment that's planning on going in. Take away, Jeff. Yeah, so <clears throat> since we signed the host community agreement with the marijuana company that didn't open, um, the law has changed, and the regulations have changed. Um, I talked to council last week and we have three options and I'll lay them out and then I'll tell you what, what I would recommend and why. Um, the first option is to waive the host community agreement. Just say we don't need one. Um, we don't think that, you know, we don't have one for a package store. So why would we have one for a dispensary? Um, the second is to use a model host community agreement that the Cannabis Control Commission provided. Um, and it is so far the only thing that they have approved. Um, They're supposed to review all host community agreements and then provide feedback um, about what is not okay if they are not okay. My understanding is that they are not doing that. They're just rejecting host community agreements and saying this isn't good. Um, 
but not telling anybody why. And the only ones they are accepting are the models. Um, the third option is we could write our own host community agreement that is based on the model host community agreement, but includes provisions that we think are important. For example, in the previous host community agreement, there was a traffic impact study before they moved in. And then I think at three, six and nine months or something like that, um, just to make sure that it didn't have a, a major impact on traffic patterns. Um, and I will remind folks that when we were having this discussion a while ago, it was still fairly early and there were still some, some lines at, at some of these places. I think that um, for the most part, it's calmed down a lot, but uh, the traffic impact study, there's a requirement that they review the security plan with our police chief and make sure that he was on board with all of that. Um, we can reserve the right to collect community impact fees if the regulations or the law change um, so that there, if there are impacts, we can, we can enforce that. Um, and then there was also something that council suggested the, the way it's written now with the <laughs> so previously towns just said hey here's what you know tell us what your gross sales are okay three percent of that it cut us a check um now communities have to say here are bills for the impacts to our community and please give us this money reimburse us um one of the things that council recommended is you know six months before they apply for um, relicensing they give us a heads up hey we're applying for relicensing so that we can put together our you know our list of, of um, impact and try to collect that because we have a certain time limit and they don't have to tell us when that time limit is so my recommendation is to do the uh, amended host community agreement um, with the same provisions that, or similar provisions as were in the previous one. And if the Cannabis Control Commission isn't happy with that, then um, they can tell us that. So I guess my, my only word of caution would be that, you know, if the select board's approach was, hey, we've been waiting for this business to open for two years, we want it to open quickly, you know, that either a waiver or the model host community agreement would have, would be the quickest option to get them through licensing. So my first feeling on this is I, I don't like <laughs> overreaching state governmental authorities um, not playing by the rules. And I don't love that they're not, not letting, they're not at least following their own recommendations or whatever for vetting these and giving critical feedback that would allow towns to work with them to come up with something that's that's not just their their cookie cutter thing so just from a sort of a social justice standpoint i kind of want to push back on that anyways um and i don't like not being able to include things that are important to the town in our own agreements doesn't sit well with me so i kind of am in the same you know place as you about wanting to put, push for the third option there um don't love going ahead without any agreement at all um, and I guess doing the model host agreement is an option, um, but I, I'd rather I'd rather at the very least give our our version, have them tell us no, and then go to Plan B or something like that. But have it be on the books that we tried, like other towns, and worked, giving a fair shake or whatnot. Because um, you know, in terms of changing the way the Canada's Control Commission does business, um, isn't going to happen if only one or two towns are complaining about it. It's going to happen if you know. 50 are. So that's sort of where I'm on, on that. Um, Crystal, do you have a, a take on this? Well, I guess you just have a, one question on our town stuff. Do we really think we're going to come up with the ability to present them with some type of bill that this cost us 3% of your gross sales? Uh, I don't think we'll get to 3%, but I think that we can say, hey, Jeff spent 80 hours working on this. This is his salary. This is what you, if you weren't here, he yeah. wouldn't be working on it. Um, you know, the council, yeah. we paid them this much amount to do this. So I think yeah. that there are some costs that we could recover, not, it, but not, not up to 3%, no. So 
then again, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but could we change maybe like the traffic study thing instead of saying, you know, they do the initial traffic study and then reimburse us when we, you know, up to three times a year or up to quarterly? Because you were saying a three, six, nine, twelve month. Mm -hmm. Because do we, you know, what I mean that saying that someone's going to do a traffic study every three months kind of sounds like a lot, right? When you're going in as a business. Yeah. But it we reserve the right to do a trap. And again, I'm just looking at, you know, is there a way to switch that wording around that if the town deems additional traffic studies, that would be a bill we present to them so that it doesn't sound like, you know, I don't know, I'm looking at it as if I was a business owner and you're telling me I've got to do a traffic study every three months. I get the initial one, yes, but you know, I, I kind of struggle with that a little bit. Yeah, I think you make a good point about that way they know that the most that they're being charged is that 3%, right? Is that if the traffic study is rolled into that 3% that we can ask them for, we're not going to come to them some year, in the first year with, here's our 3% reimbursement, plus you had to pay for four traffic studies. It kind of makes it, and also in terms of getting the, the Cannabis Control Commission to accept our host agreement. We're not asking for something that's sort of outside of their standard thing. What we're saying is, hey, we're going to use that 3%. This is one of the things we're going to roll into that 3% that we can already ask for reimbursement on. Yeah, right, if we feel like it's necessary. Yeah, and I think, I think and also, exactly, if we feel necessary, then it also leads the control over whether we think it's necessary to do it. Maybe we do one at the three-month mark or six-month mark and go, we don't need to keep doing these. Traffic hasn't changed at all. At which point, isn't you know, if we have it built into the agreement, we ha they have to do it because it's part of the agreement. Whereas if we leave that as a prerogative that we can roll into that three percent. Yeah, I mean, I want them to do the initial one. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, and I I think it is reasonable that their security be reviewed with our police chief. I I would struggle that the state doesn't think that's a reasonable request. Right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think we're asking for anything in excess, except for, like I said, that, that every, you know, three, six, nine, twelve month traffic study thing might, might be a deterrent to somebody, you know, if, I mean, how much does a traffic study cost? We're not talking a $25 bill here. No, I mean, I, I think the only the only pushback is that with talking to council, they said that that it's really the they, the cannabis control commission is really striking out any monetary things in the contract. So if we say you have to do a traffic study, that's non monetary. If we say you have to reimburse us for a traffic study, then it is mon like. And I think the, the Cannabis Control Commission's, or what I would do if I were them, is to say, yeah, and the town could have been pressuring, you know, the, this company to sign a host community agreement, and it had to include these these financial terms where, yeah, they didn't really want to, and the can you know, so yeah, I'm not saying we can't do that if that's what, if that's what we think is best, but I it may actually. It may actually be um, the the cannabis control commission may not like it as much. Okay. Even though it, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. No. Like I said, I just and again we were talking about this at a different time, right? On this initial one, and traffic was different, and everything else. Um, it just sounds like you're going to get you know as a business owner. Right? I'm going to feel like I can barely finish one traffic study and you want me to do another one. What could have changed in three months? I know we want to prove nothing changed in three months, and that's the initial, you know, thought process behind it, but. 
Yeah, and I mean, I, w- I wonder if, if, to your point, Crystal, and I'll, I'll raise this with counsel and see what she thinks, but, you know, maybe we don't put, you know, we keep the first one in there, we get rid of the three, six, nine months, and then if, if the select board in five months says, hey, traffic seems to be a little different, let's do a traffic study because we have a merit, that's an impact on the community, I think that... I don't think we need it in the host community agreement to ask for reimbursement is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. and I think that that's a, a, an easier way of getting that through the Kansas Public Information is not even spell out those supplemental studies, but just to plan on doing them if, if necessary and then rolling that into that 3%. So. Right. Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add on this? One, so is the 3% built into the, the regular host one or is, is it something we'd be doing in addition? Um, the model one. Is, is there a three percent in there? I don't think so. It, um, community impact fee. I don't. I think they say it can't be more than. More than. Okay. But I don't think it says. Yeah. So the things we're looking for, in addition to the discussion with the police and the and the transportation. Yep. yep. And there's yeah, traffic. I, think, I think that's about it. Okay. I don't think it's unreasonable. Um, well, and, and the, the requirement for security to be turned off by the, the chief of police, aside from potentially us billing them in, in that three percent for the chief's time for that and rolling that into our county expenses, that's not something where we're worth it. Unless I'm mistaken, they're going to have to come up with money in order to do that. So that's not going to be considered a monetary ask from the Kansas Control Commission's perspective. That's just us asking them to make sure the security, you know, drives with our police's understanding of how that should work. Um, okay, so um, do you need us to make a decision on that or, do, or are you looking to get the information from us today and then talk to council and then come back in two weeks to decide? Um, I think I think I, I have the direction. Um, I'll talk to council and ask her to draft something and then we can take a look at that at the next meeting. Okay. Great. Okay. Anything else, uh, Crystal or Dan, before we move on? I'm good. I'm good. All right. That is it for the marijuana host community agreement discussion. Um, and that is it for new business. Uh, next up under old business is select board updates. Um, I don't have anything. Oh, actually, that's not true. I do have one thing. Um, just wanted to thank everybody who participated in Franklin County Pride this past Saturday up in Greenfield. Um, it was very well attended. It was. Um, very wonderful event. Lots of people were very uh, enthusiastic. Um, didn't hear about any negatives or anything like that. So, just a big, big thank you to all the communities for participating in that and for making it um, a success again. Crystal, do you have anything you want to bring up? I'm all set. Thank you. Right, Dan, just um, I guess all the only else is we did have Village Center Committee last week. We're still working our way through. We're look kind of uh, landing on calming the whole corridor. I mean, all the way through, kind of like from the bridge all the way up to the Frosty um, to kind of narrow things down. But then at the intersection, we were kind of looking at the two options, kind of giving them a little more um, definition. And that's where we are. Where we are there, the only other thing I'd mention is um, this discussion to bring DOT to the next meeting and get some discussions going uh, with them about what's possible, what they like, you know, where we could go, funding sources, that kind of thing. Great. Thank you, Dan. Yep. All right. Uh, that should be it for us for select board updates. Jeff, uh, time minister updates. Yep. Um, it's hot. <laughs> so uh, the senior center um, is having a cooling hours from 10 to 4 at 22 Amherst Road, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, Wednesday is a holiday, so I think all public buildings are going to be closed. Uh, I will say that when the library is open or the town office building is open, feel free to come in here and cool off as well. Um, we can get you water. So try and stay cool the next couple days. Um, and then next Wednesday at 11 a.m. at Hurleyhe Park is the Senior Center annual picnic. Um, and you can purchase tickets and hopefully attend, and it's a, it's a good time. So that's all I got. Yep. Well, those tickets are $10, um, and I believe that information is... Is that on our town website, Jeff? Uh, if it is, it will get it up there. Yep. 
been great. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so I actually have a question about the cooling centers, Jeff. Yep. Do we know, does Sanderson Place, does that have air conditioning, like in their common rooms and stuff like that for the residents there? In, I don't know if they have, I'll check on the common rooms. I know they have them in the rooms. Cindy, you don't? Yeah. Okay. Cindy, Cindy knows. <laughs> it is air conditioned in there. In I the don't common know. areas also? Yes. Yep, the whole okay. thing is. Okay. I'm just curious because, you know, that's a, a population that would, has the potential to be heat or cold sensitive. Yep. Yeah, I don't know if they allow that or if we have to go to life pack or something like that to consider that. No, no, I'm not asking for us to make that a designated center. I'm, I was just thinking, would that potentially be a population that we have to find someplace for? Right. For okay. being your boy. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, I'm not looking to expand their common areas for the public to come into. Okay. All right, and Jeff did mention something that I want to... Um, make sure we touch on, and that is that the uh, town offices will be closed this Wednesday, June 19th, in observation of June 18th. Um, and we want to just, uh, you know, mention that to everybody. All right, Jeff, anything else? Nope, uh, that's it for me. All right, um, we have our agenda in executive session. We are not running a meeting for executive session. Um, that will be postponed to a future meeting. Our next meeting will be Monday, July 1st. Uh, which is in two weeks um, at our normal 6.30 time. At this time, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I motion we adjourn. Second. All right, we have, we have a motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye, Crystal Drake, turn by. Aye. Bye, Nathaniel Ware. All right, take us out, Jeff, at 7.44.